Welcome back everyone. Today I have something very special to share with you. For the past several months I have been polishing up my new deep reinforcement learning framework. It is designed for hobbyists that don't have access to cloud infrastructure and only want to run things on their machine to enable them to rapidly prototype uh, deep reinforcement learning agents. It's built on top of PyTorch and it's pretty easy to get started with. But first, if you're new here, I am Dr. Phil Tabor. In 2012, I got my PhD in condensed matter physics, probably went to work at Intel Corporation as a back-end dry edge process engineer, left there and have been doing artificial intelligence ever since. So let's take a look at the GitHub for this and then we'll take another look at a really quick example to show you how easy it is to get up and running with this framework. So right out of the box, this uh, runs a number of popular agents. So it will accommodate uh, deep Q learning, including the double and dueling variants and proximal policy optimization. Uh, it also does deep deterministic policy gradients, twin delayed deep deterministic policy gradients and soft factor critic, and of course, prioritized experience replay. So a number of popular algorithms right off the bat, and I am working on implementing some more advanced stuff because let's be, let's be frank, those are relatively old algorithms. So I'm working on implementing uh, things like Apex, random network distillation, R2D2, and never give up. So I look forward to uh, releasing those in the very near future. So make sure to start the repo so you get those updates. Uh, as far as how to install it, I don't have it on PyPy yet. I am working on that. For now, all you have to do is clone it and follow these instructions to install it locally on your machine. Uh, it's pretty straightforward if you've ever done it. So let's take a look at a simple tutorial. And I kind of talk about my design decisions in here and how things work. Uh, so it is compatible with a number of environments right off the bat. Uh, it will run Atari environments. It has all of the included wrappers you need to do things like downsampling, frame stacking, um, and conversion to grayscale, and all of that for you without any additional work on your part. For our own purposes, let's uh, go ahead and just use the cart pull environment because it runs pretty quickly. Now, of course, every... Uh, Deep learning agent needs neural networks, and these are no exceptions. So I've kind of constructed this in a way that you can construct modular types of deep neural networks. So I've composed the agent networks in terms of a base and a head. So the base interacts with the environment and performs some activations on it, typically ReLU or TAN hyperbolic. And then it passes that off to a head network that can feed out either probabilities for probability distributions, soft maxes, or you know q values for deep q learning in the case of what we're looking at in this tutorial so it has several different heads right off the bat and several different bases and creating an agent is relatively simple uh, so you just declare the base object the head object and combine them in a sequential uh, which is of course from pytorch so uh, in the case of deep q learning uh, what you want is uh, an online and a target network uh, that's to prevent um, basically the agent chasing its tail as it's learning. So the purpose of the online network is to learn to interact with the environment. The target gives it uh, like a target estimate for the values of each action given some particular state. If that changes too quickly, then the agent just chases its tail and the le learning becomes unstable. Now, there is a function that handles this for you. Just You can just import make DQ and networks and it'll do all of this heavy lifting for you. This is pretty much uh, the code from that file, but this is just to show you how things are constructed. So let's make our networks. And of course, since it's a Jupyter Notebook, it takes a second to run. I'm not a big fan of Jupyter Notebooks, but it is great for this particular format. So now agents um, are comprised of policies as well, right? You need a policy to tell you how to act in the environment. I've included a number of options here, a beta policy for sampling probabilistic actions that's mostly used in PPO, a discrete policy for um, for a categorical distribution that's also used in PPO, and these both facilitate the calculation of entropy if you need that in your loss function. Of course, for deep Q learning, we need an epsilon greedy policy. Now, if you're not familiar with it, epsilon greedy just means that some percentage of the time dictated by a hyperparameter called epsilon, the agent takes a random action, and then the one minus epsilon uh, amount of the time, it takes the best known action. So it acts greedily. So it's epsilon greedy. And then, of course, a Gaussian policy if you need to sample a normal distribution and a noisy deterministic policy for things like TD3 and DDPG, where it gives you a deterministic value and adds some noise to it. All this long-winded to say we need a policy that tells our agent to act. Now, agents themselves, I've taken a cue from 
uh, deep mind on this because obviously they're the experts. I'm just some YouTuber. Uh, and in their architecture, they have something called actor learner. Uh, what this does is it separates the activities of interacting with the environment and generating sample data in an actor and learning from that data in a learner object, a learner agent. Now, the intent here is that the actor, each actor can live on a thread with its own environment. So you can kind of deal with the sample complexity problem, which is to say, for deep reinforcement learning, you need huge amounts of samples for the agent to learn how to do anything useful. So you can use multi-threaded workstations to rapidly generate samples to deal with the sample complexity of any given algorithm. Now, each actor, uh, in principle lives in its own thread interacting with its own environment. I have to finish, uh, I have to flesh out the implementation of this. This is just a 0.1, but that's kind of the idea behind it. Now each actor generates data, feeds it to a centralized replay buffer, and the learner samples that data, uses that data to uh, calculate loss functions and update its deep neural networks. Then every time step, the actor in each thread downloads the most recent weights from the learner network. So that way, um, and that is a hyperparameter you can play with. You can have the actor update every 10 steps, whatever number of steps you want. But nonetheless, um, this is how we can facilitate uh, the rapid uh, solution to the sample complexity problem. And I go into a little bit of detail here in the text, but the basic idea is we have to combine our actor and learner into an agent class. Now memory turns out to be a little bit tricky because I wanted to write a single class that would handle both um, continuous action and discrete action spaces. So we have to pass in a flag telling it what type of action space we have. In addition to that, some other stuff like a max size, our observation, observation shape, the batch size we want to sample, number of actions, and whether or not we want to use prioritized experience replay. Uh, now this memory buffer is centralized, meaning that every actor uploads data to this and then the single learner downloads data from it to update its neural networks. Uh, this is totally generalized. If you wanna store, let's say, uh, additional parameters in your memory class, this can facilitate that. I would encourage you to take a look at the source code uh, to see how that is done. But this is our simple example. So now that we have a policy, our networks, our actor and learner and our agent, all we need to do is play the games. So this is accomplished through something called an episode loop. Uh, this is an object that takes the agent, environment, memory, and a sample mode for uh, playing the games. Uh, in this case, the sample mode is just uniform because we're doing uniform sampling of our, of our memory buffer to update our learner. Uh, and it will play a number of games once we tell it to run. Now, of course, I do support model saving uh, with one important caveat which is that at this point, I have not implemented model checkpointing with the intention of pausing training and resuming later. Now, this is a pretty simple thing to do. I have a YouTube video on that. However, the way I've constructed the framework separating everything out, uh, your policies being separate from agents, actors, and learners, and all that stuff in the memory, that does make it a little bit cumbersome to do that. Um, I could come up with a kludgy solution, but I prefer something a little more elegant. And so I'm trying to think of a good way of doing that. But nonetheless, that is coming. So you'll be able to see that in the very near future. So next we can play a small number of games. So you just hit play when you tell it to run the episode loop and it prints out the result of each episode as well as the average score over the previous 100 games. And of course it also prints out the number of uh, steps to the terminal as well, so you can see how long it has been training. So this will run for not too terribly long, but you can see it has already started to learn. Uh, deep Q learning is a little finicky sometimes. In reality, all deep reinforcement learning is finicky. There's a huge amount of run-to-run -run variation. That's something we just have to live with. You can mitigate it to some extent by carefully choosing uh, seeds for your uh, neural networks as well as your episodes. But you can see that after a couple hundred episodes, scores have started to, uh, this is difficult to navigate, but you can see that scores have started to creep up over time. And so it's learning and doing relatively well in the cart pull environment. Once this finishes, we'll be able to uh, plot our data. I do have plotting built in. It's not particularly fancy, but it's easy to modify a plotting function, right? So let's give this a second to finish and then I'll show you the plot.
Okay, so that has finished up. And you can see that the scores were going on average up and up and up. So let's plot our learning curve and see how it looks. And you can see that it's pretty much a straight line up. Pretty cool. I like progress like that. Okay, so you can see that in just a few lines of code, you can get a fully operational deep learning agent to interact with at least a simple environment. And switching over to something like uh, say the Atari environments is just as simple as changing the name of the string that you pass to the um, to the make environment function. Uh, I do have in the documentation here some other things you need to tweak, like using for using prioritized replay, um, all that kind of stuff. But it's all relatively straightforward. So I would hope that you can download this and please try to break it. I haven't tested it on every possible configuration. As of right now, it doesn't work on Windows as far as I'm aware. I haven't tested it. But please try to download it, run it, see if you can break it, make feature requests, and uh, use it for your own environments. So the next thing I'm working on, if you're interested, is um, I want to take a bit of a different direction on the channel. Uh, honestly, I if you watch this far, thanks for listening. But I've honestly kind of been... Um, less than enamored with the LLM stuff uh, as time has gone on. They're kind of interesting. I don't think they're a path to AGI. I still think deep reinforcement learning is probably a closer avenue to the goal of artificial general intelligence. And so I'm going to focus more on that. And I do think that alternative computing will come into play. And so I'm going to start looking into quantum computing because that's kind of near and dear to my heart as a physicist. I didn't do it as a graduate student, but of course I do love all things quantum mechanics. So for my next video, or perhaps the second to next video, I'm going to take a look at a recent paper. I've already started to reproduce the results for it. Uh, let's take a look at that really quick right now. And it's this paper... It's this paper right here, Quantum Architecture Research via Deep Reinforcement Learning. And the basic idea here is that the authors used proximal policy optimization to perform um, circuit optimization on quantum circuits for creating relatively trivial states with two and three qubits. So it's nothing groundbreaking, but IBM did recently come out with a paper uh, in May last month from the from when the time I'm filming, filming this of using uh, PPO to... Um, what is it to improve quantum transpiling? Basically, quantum architectures are all over the map. And so when you write code, it has to be uh, mapped to the physical hardware of the quantum computer you want to run it on. And that's called transpiling. And you can use PPO to minimize or deep reinforcement learning in general to minimize the circuit depth and number of swap operations that are quite costly and noise prone in quantum computing. So that's kind of the direction I want to take on this channel. I'm going to be pivoting more towards quantum computing and AI type content. If you'd like to see that, and if you're interested in that, make sure to hit that subscribe button. I'd recommend hitting the bell because, you know, well, let's be honest, I don't upload very often, but when I do, you probably want to be notified of that. Uh, and in our next videos, we're going to take a look at this paper as well as some other stuff around uh, AGI and alternate routes to it other than the LLM hype. So I hope this was helpful for you. Please check out the framework. The link is in the description, and I'll see you in the next video.